So you mentioned the tanker market, and obviously we're going to discuss that a lot in this episode. So what's the best analogy or summary even of, the, of how it is to navigate in the tanker market? Because it's massive if you look at it as data points that matters, right? So how do you summarize working in a tanker industry? Well, well, first of all, uh, people have to, to, to remember that... Um, Tanker markets are mean reverting. You know, it's uh, it's an extremely cyclical industry, and and it it uh, it will eventually move back to a mean, which is somewhere around where you actually get a return on a an investment of a ship, a twenty year investment on a ship, um, and uh, and uh, you know the, the tanker markets will be extremely volatile because you'll have over investment in ships. Uh, or in tonnage and then under investment in tonnage and then you will have the demand moving kind of really crazy from time to time um, but also i think the lack of i mentioned on technical analysis i mentioned efficient markets information being evenly shared in the market you absolutely don't have that in the tanker industry at all um, and and uh, that kind of brings me further to the fact that you actually don't have that in oil markets either when people talk about efficient markets, one tends to look at the, the currency markets. So currencies are, you know, there's so much information kind of roaming around the currency markets. It's extremely liquid. And, and uh, you can basically place any size of bet at any point of time. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so, so that's regarded maybe one of the most efficient markets in the world. Uh, tanker is the total opposite. Um, so, so the, there's a vast array of information that needs to be kind of analyzed and chewed on. And I, I think just the sheer volatility of the tanker market tells you that nobody really knows what's going to come next. Can we explain why that is a fact? For people may think that why can't we solve this puzzle to understand the equation more fully than obviously it's the case today, right? Well, we have actually started to solve it to some extent, and and this uh, by the introduction of, you know, just to just to to explain to listeners who's not familiar with shipping. So, every ship in the world has a beacon. You know, it's basically a radio signal that's pulsating and being sent out uh, every minute, every hour of the day, and uh, it's an anti-collision system. It's called an AIS transponder, and every ship over a certain uh, kind of tonnage needs to have it. Uh, you'll even, even fa- find kind of pressure crafts in the Oslo Fjord, uh, you know, having an AIS transponder, really low tech kind of radio signal thingy. So s- at some point during uh, mid 2000s, um, low orbiting satellites were able to pick up that signal. Prior to that, you actually, it was only port states and other vessels that picked up this signal. But the minute low orbiting satellites could actually catch that signal, that radio signal, and decipher it, uh, it was like the oceans of the world were lit up with these uh, kind of uh, red dots and green dots and black dots that you now can Google and you'll find them on the internet. And But prior to that happening, nobody really knew where your ship was and nobody really knew what um, kind of your ship was doing and when it was expected into the Middle East, for instance, or when it was ex- expected into the US Gulf. And at that time, the owner had kind of half the puzzle and the charter had the other half of the puzzle and it was like a kind of it was uh, and and the you know obviously the owner could spoof the charter the charter could spoof the owner and uh, but it was like kind of an evenly uh, even strength kind of relationship once kind of ais became broadly um uh, kind of accessible and uh, we did it when i was working with uh, with glencore we utilized that data uh, quite vividly in the beginning, uh, actually to the point where we signed an agreement with a Canadian satellite provider just to buy the raw data to try and get ahead of the curve on, on analyzing this data. And suddenly you had an overview of every ship's position in the world. And this has obviously driven the market to become more efficient. The, the challenge for the ship owners is that it hasn't really helped us. You know, it's basically it's given away our information uh, but we still don't know uh, how many cargoes there are. Uh, you know, the demand side have been able to kind of hide their cards better. 
Uh, but on the other side of it, the analyzing the, the, the markets, looking at uh, supply and demand in the world, refinery margins and so forth, has also become more accessible. So it means that the owner, if he utilizes it, can also get a, a kind of a, a better feel. You know, back, back in the 90s, uh, most of these markets were trading OTCs or over the counter. So there wasn't like a Reuters platform you could go to to figure out what uh, the jet crack was out in Asia. Now all this is on Bloomberg or on Reuters. So it means that if an owner does his homework or an analyst does his homework, we've kind of managed to even out the odds to some extent, right? We know what economists kind of work. So, so, so I would say that the market is getting kind of gradually more efficient, um, but, but we're yet not there. That's fascinating. So if we play out a scenario where you have full transparency through the whole supply chain, who has the most to fear? Or say in another way, like who is hiding the cards and thereby can make more money relative to others, right? Maybe it's a hard question to answer, but yeah, but, but I, I still think it will be uh, kind of uh, at least for now, it's the the cargo owners. You know, it's uh, it's the refineries. They know what their schedule is going to be like. Um, <clears throat> you know, that they they know kind of what their runs are going to be. Uh, the refiners speak to the oil traders or the oil majors, uh, or they are an oil major. Um, so, so, so they and they schedule kind of months ahead. You know, kind of a refiner today will plan for probably start to plan for winter demand uh, 2022. So, so, so they will kind of know. Uh, but kind of where the owners kind of might be able to fight back is on pure S and D in the tax market. You know, if there is a limited amount of the taxes in the world, you know, uh, kind of knowing the taxes and working together with the taxes will actually start to mean something. We're not yet there, but but uh, but that was actually the case, you know, during kind of the, the most extreme bull runs in tankers. It was actually for a short run. It was really important to be good friends with an owner and to have a long lasting relationship with an owner, because otherwise the owner just wouldn't offer. And I, I think it's well, it's, it's like a wet dream of any owner, but but you know, you now have almost a whole generation in the chartering part of it. You know, the, the guys booking ships that never really been to you know working in the tight market. They don't know about kind of how important these relationships can be. So so hopefully they're going to have a kind of a crude awakening once um, <laughs> once this market tightens up. 